Good evening to one and all. Today we have organized the 38th session of our East Pathakas interview session. I am Shomo Shaha, the founder of East Pathakas and the organizer of today's session. Today we have organized the 38th session of our India Yesterday and Today series. Uh, today's sub theme is Modernity and Cultural Studies in Kerala. Our previous interview session with Professor Evangeline Karina Longclaw has been uploaded in our East Pathakas YouTube channel, whose link has also been provided in our Facebook page. Today we have with us Professor Ajay S. Shekhar, who is an assistant professor in the Department of English from SSUS Gallery, Kerala. Just a minute. There seems to be a problem. Yeah. Today we have with us Professor Ajay S. Shekhar from SSUS Kalari, Kerala. He is an assistant professor in the Department of English. He is also a research supervisor and coordinator of the Center for Buddhist Studies in his university. He has published papers and translations in journals, including EPW on Indian literature. His PhD was on caste and gender margins as represented in Indian fiction. It has been published as a book called Representing the Margin. His other published works are on the Renaissance leaders of Kerala. He has also translated Dalit poetry from Malayalam in English and Bell Hooks Morrison in, Kerala, in Malayalam. His recent published works are on Buddhism and Kerala, recovering the modern and democratic dimension. We are incredibly grateful to Professor Shekhar for joining, us, joining with us today. We welcome him to, the, to, to our today's session. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Thank and you. For the, for, the, for the purpose of conducting Professor Shekhar's interview, we have with us Professor Pradeep Basu of the Department of Political Science Presidency, University of Kolkata. Professor Basu, before teaching his residency, has been a teacher in the Scottish Church College, Kolkata. He has, gotten, he has done his PhD from the Center for Studies in Social Sciences, Calcutta, and his research interests include the Noxlite movement and post-colonial politics regarding which he has published and edited various books. Therefore, without spending any more time, I'll move on to Professor Basu and request him to start today's interview. Thank you very much, Shomo and East Patakas. And special welcome to Dr. Ajoy S. Shekhar. He is from a... Thank you for being here. Uh, you are from a remote place from Kolkata. And I am in a remote place from Ernakulam. <laughs> so it is good that webinars made part of life difficult, but there are certain things which are good so that we can meet and talk here. Today, our topic is modernity and cultural studies in Kerala. We know Kerala and Malayali culture, Malayalam language, all are very rich and have a long tradition. And I am very fortunate that a learned professor, scholar from Kerala is here present. And I have the opportunity to know about modernity and its impact on culture in Kerala. So the first thing I would like to know, the very common concept of colonial modernity, which we faced in Bengal and which have been has been discussed by so many scholars. 
that when the British came along with colonialism, modernity came to our country and this modernity was enlightenment modernity but it is a different type of modernity because at the same time it is colonial modernity. However, with all its limitations, it resulted in some kind of intellectual awakening, which is known as Renaissance. In West Bengal, this Renaissance has been discussed to a large extent, including Ram Mohan, Vidyashagor, then Rabindranath, so many other people. But here we want to know about Kerala. So I will request Professor Shikhar to throw light on modernity and renaissance in Kerala and its cultural politics. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful and uh, very pertinent question in the present when modernity at large is in peril uh, throughout India and also in many parts of the world, many reactionary regressions and pre-modern kind of uh, uh, going back to uh, the kind of primitive past and uh, plenty of uh, revivalisms, especially that of the cultural national and also the jingoistic kind of ultra-national kind of uh, formations are coming back in the country today. Uh, it's one of the most uh, significant and uh, contemporary and uh, relevant issues to discuss the question of modernity. So modernity at large, as uh, you have pointed out rightly, is actually the product of enlightenment in Europe. And that post enlightenment uh, thinking and the intellectual tradition, it has reached our souls, of course, through the colonial kind of uh, uh, practice and ideology. So the imperial ideology and the colonial practice, these uh, uh, actually actually uh, exposed the Asian and African countries to the modernity of Europe at large. But as the very term suggests, it was a Eurocentric kind of modernity. And of course, the Enlightenment and post-Enlightenment thinkers, they couldn't uh, see something beyond Europe as uh, human and as equal, as questioned and challenged by all the post-colonial uh, or anti-colonial and later post-colonial writers from all those uh, people, from the African writers to the Indian writers, uh, to all those outside Europe. So though it was a kind of compromised and partial and diluted and uh, colonial kind of a modernity. It has resulted in many social turbulences and upheavals and churnings and uh, uh, many kind of breaks it provided to the people at the bottom of these societies, especially in Asia, in South Asia, and also in many parts of Africa, it has provided a greater models of uh, universalism, greater models of liberation, and also the notion of, uh, uh, of law, uh, justice at large, and uh, the, 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 uh, the fruits of uh, modern uh, technological innovations and education at large, it reached our shores through that. So it's uh, as the post-colonial critics would argue, uh, like Catherine Spivak talking about uh, the, the burden of English and also it's a medicine at the same time. It's a, 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 it's a drug or it's a poison and medicine at the same time. It's having those two dimensions anyway. Uh, that is the dialectics of modernity in uh, the post-colonial world. Uh, so in the case of Kerala, it was the Portuguese who began the kind of colonization. Uh, soon after uh, uh, Columbus and uh, Vasco da Gama in particular, who reached uh, the shores of Malabar or the Kerala coast towards the end of the 15th century in 1498, uh, uh, Vasco da Gama uh, reached uh, Calicut, uh, the Kapad beach of Calicut, and the trade began. 
And gradually, they actually they began their trade settlements and uh, they created the colonies. And then it was uh, in the 16th and uh, uh, early 17th century, the Portuguese uh, have, uh, uh, have created a real colonial kind of enterprise throughout the coastal, uh, through the, uh, the Congan coast and uh, in many parts of Kerala. But in the 17th century, it was the Dutch uh, who are actually competing with the Portuguese. And the Dutch have also established their colonies. And the Dutch also, they created many intellectual kind of enterprises, especially the codification of the flora and fauna, the kind of compilation of medicinal plants and uh, many books and uh, geographical explorations and uh, chartering and documenting the kind of uh, knowledge traditions and the local kind of law it was done by the Portuguese uh, by the Dutch soon after the Portuguese especially in the uh, 17th century so we have works uh, uh, like uh, the Hortus Malabari Cruz uh, which actually which is a huge compilation of the native uh, plants uh, the medicinal plants of uh, of Malabar uh, in which many local uh, uh, kind of traditional medical uh, people who are having this ancient Buddhist legacy of, uh, of, uh, of Ayurveda and the local kind of uh, medicinal uh, kind of uh, uh, practice. So they were involved like Itti Achudan of, uh, uh, of Katakarapalli in Alapura district. Uh, such traditional medical practitioners were involved in uh, the Dutch when the Dutch governor, Henrik uh, Van Reed, uh, when he codified that Hortus Malabaricus, which is about the uh, the medicinal uh, plants of Malabar. So uh, colonialism, at least from the Dutch period onwards, it was uh, creating a kind of knowledge output and uh, certain knowledge institutions and uh, epistemological kind of uh, developments were part of the colonial mm. enterprise. So when the Britishers actually eventually, when they got... Uh, absolute control of South India after the defeat of Tipu Sultan in particular, uh, or towards the end of the 18th century in 1792 with that pact between the British and the, uh, the Mysore regime led by Tipu. Uh, they have also established their uh, uh, university system and the education system and uh, the people at the bottom who are actually who were suffering from the caste system and the Varna uh, or Chaturvanya system of Kerala and India, which was the most inhuman kind of system uh, that was existing anywhere in the world. So the people, the majority of the people, they were outside the Chaturvanya system. The majority of the people in Kerala and South India, they were having the Buddhist and Jain and Ajivaga traditions, the non-Hindu, the non-Brahminical traditions till early Middle Ages. Only from the 8th and 9th century, Brahminism got a kind of uh, uh, foothold in South India. And the people, the majority of people, they were Bahujans, now considered as Dalit Bahujans or the Avarna. They were actually outside this Chaturvurnya system because of uh, their Buddhist kind of uh, ancestry and the Buddhist kind of cultural affiliations. So uh, these people who were denied education, denied human rights, denied the right of letters and the alphabets, so they got an opportunity of equal education, of learning uh, modern science and technology, of learning new things through English education. So English education that began in early 19th century in Kerala, the missionaries, they have uh, intervened in South Kerala, in Travancore, uh, and also south of Travancore, Nanjinad. The region now is in Kanyagumari and Tirunelveli district, part of Tamil Nadu now, because it was part of the ancient South India as a unit, you need to, historically speaking, you need to take South India as a unit. It was known as, uh, the ancient Tamil Agam or the Tamil country, the great Tamil country comprising of various uh, uh, kingdoms, including the Chera, the Chola, the Pandya, uh, uh, the Pallava, and so many other uh, small kingdoms were there. So uh, uh, Tamil was actually the ancient language, the ancient Dravidian. 
or the Prakrit of the South uh, is actually Tamil or Damila, as it is called, or Dravida in uh, in modern kind of use, in Orientalist kind of discourse. It became Dravidian uh, or modern epigraphy and uh, linguistics. It categorizes it uh, as Dravidian kind of thing. It is actually from the Dravida or Damila or Tamila, Tamila, Damila, Dravida, Dravidian. So that is the evolution of that term. So uh, actually it was ancient Tamil, which is one of the ancient languages of the world and which is still a, a life language. That is the, uh, the, the, the specificity or the uniqueness of this language is that it is having at least 2,500 or 2,600 years of continuous existence and evolution. It has remained from the time of the Buddha and the Tirthankara, uh, especially Mahavira and the Buddha, up to the present, uh, the South Indian Tang Tamil is having such a, a, a continuous kind of cultural history. And uh, Kannada and actually Malayalam, these languages, these uh, and also Telugu, these were actually formed later, or these were there as regional variations. Uh, something that is spoken towards uh, the eastern part of the Western Ghat is actually the proper Tamil or Param Tamil, and it became the modern Tamil later. And what was spoken uh, at the western part of the Western Ghats, so on the western coast of the Western Ghats, it uh, became something called Malayam Tamil variety. And later in the Middle Ages, it got a distinct kind of uh, development because of high Sanskritization. Uh, that happened along with the Brahminical and the Hindu kind of uh, 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 invasions and uh, assimilation. So that has become uh, something called modern Malayalam only by the 15th and 16th century when Erutachan, who is considered as the so-called father of uh, Malayalam language and Malayalam poetry, uh, he was only in the 16th century. So if you consider Erutachan as the father, uh, it's having only a legacy of 400 years. Uh, so beyond that, it is Malayam Tamil and various varieties of Param Tamil or old Tamil varieties are there. Uh, so anyway, the point is that uh, the people who are held to this long legacy of the Sangam age, which is called the South Indian ancient times, it's categorized along with the Sangam of uh, Buddhism. It's a key word from uh, Buddhism. Uh, Sangham, Buddham, and Dhamma. Uh, so uh, this period, this ancient period of uh, CE common era, especially from the time of the Buddha, that is BC 6th century to almost uh, CE uh, 6th or 7th century, this broad period of almost 1,200 years or 1,000 years uh, at least, this is marked as the uh, Sangham age in uh, in South India. So Kerala or Chera land earlier during that era in sea common era uh, at the beginning uh, Kerala was known as the Chera land uh, because it is uh, mentioned in the Edicts of Ashoka. The Edicts of Ashoka uh, mentions uh, 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 the people of Kerala as Kerala Puto or Kerala Puto, that is what, uh, that means the people of Kerala, the enlightened people of Kerala, that is the address of uh, Emperor Ashoka to the people of Kerala. So he acknowledges the Chera, the, Cha, uh, the, pa, the Pandya, uh, the Pallava, the Satyaputra or Andhra people, and he salutes them all. These uh, are the people, the enlightened people who are with his ethics of the Dharma, and that is why he greeted all of them in his uh, rock edicts. So that kind of a greater legacy we were having, but unfortunately because of the Sanskritization and the Brahmanization that happened in early Middle Ages, from the eighth century onwards, uh, the Chaturvarnia was established, the caste system uh, has uh, uh, been fixed here by the Middle Ages, uh, at least by the 12th and 13th century. And it was severe when the Portuguese were here in the uh, 15th and 16th century. And the people were, uh, the people who were held to the greater legacy of the Changam tradition or the Sangam culture, which was an egalitarian and a casteless kind of a society. Uh, it, it has created uh, the, the epics 
the great epics of Tamil language and uh, a kind of tremendous poetry, the diverse kind of poetry which is called, uh, which was translated by uh, A.K. Ramanujan himself into English language uh, under the title Poems of Love and War, translations from the ancient uh, Tamil classical poetry. And uh, these epics, the fivefold epics, uh, in which uh, some of them are religious epics as well. Silapodikaram, uh, which was written by Ilanko Adigal, a Chera prince, a younger prince. Uh, it's actually a Jain epic uh, in Tamil language, which was composed in early common era. And uh, Manimekali, which is a sequel that was written by Chatanar, uh, uh, a contemporary of Ilanko is actually a Buddhist epic. So we were having uh, these kind of Buddhist and Jain and Ajivaka kind of uh, 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 non-Brahmanical kind of philosophies and traditions and uh, the Tirukural of Tiruvalluva, which is actually a, an ethical treatise of Tamilagam, which combines these Shramanic traditions in a non-Brahmanical, non-Hindu way. So this was actually the tradition, but it was all lost in the kind of uh, Varnashrama regime, the project of Varnashrama. Chaturvanya has uh, uh, subsided it all and people were subjugated. So these people who are made into untouchables and Dalits and outcasts in the Chaturvanya system, they got a break, they got a kind of modern education. And that's why when the missionaries intervened, the missionaries of uh, the Christian world, Europe, when they intervened in early 19th century, uh, the untouchables they have embraced, uh, most of them, uh, they tried to embrace Christianity and at least they have um, admitted their children to the schools and they learned English language. And that's why a change was possible in early 19th century. That's why uh, local uh, sages and saints like uh, Ayya Vaikuntha Swami, for example. Ayya Vaikuntha Swami, he came from the untouchable section of the Nadar or Chanar community. And he was actually preaching equality and he organized the first group of Dalits and untouchables into his fold called uh, uh, Samatva Samajam. Samatva Samajam means a society for equality. It's like the Satyashotak Samaj of Mahatma Phule. Uh, and it was even before that. Mahatma Phule began it only in the 1840s and 1850s. But uh, Ayya Vaikunthan or Ayya Vaikuntha Swami, he actually organized the Samatva Samaj in 1836. And he organized all the untouchable cars, so 18 or more uh, untouchable cars into that fold. And he was uh, fighting the caste system in South Travancore called Nanjinad. And he was using the Chitta tradition. Chitta tradition is the Siddha tradition, which has its roots in the Vajrayana Buddhist kind of esoteric specialized forms of Vajrayana or Tantric Buddhism. And later it got uh, merged with the Shaivite Siddhanta or the Shaiva Siddhanta of South India, of Tamilagam. Mm -hmm. So the Shaiva Siddhanta and the Vajrayana kind of Siddha practices, it was creating a kind of medicinal and uh, highly specialized yogic kind of practice. So that Siddha yogic tradition was used by Ayya Vaiguntar as a, a kind of strategic ploy, a cultural kind of, uh, 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 of, uh, uh, of resistance against uh, uh, the caste system. And he began his educational and social reform kind of activities. But not, unfortunately, he was tortured by the monarchy of Travancore under the Maharaja called Swati Tirunal during that uh, period, early 19th century. Uh, he was actually arrested uh, for violating the rules of caste and whatnot, and he was imprisoned in his uh, uh, tiger den or panther den, a torture chamber for almost 140 days. And unfortunately, he lost his health, but still he has uh, written something about the liberation of the people, and he, was, uh, he became a mystic after his uh, acquittance from the uh, del deliverance from the jail, uh, he uh, acted as a mystic and he couldn't survive much, but he uh, he wrote it down in his verses, in his uh, Uchipatip uh, 
and uh, which means higher learning and also arulnul means a composition a garland like composition on the absolute arulnul which is padipu and uh, so many other compositions through the verse form of the Siddha tradition. Uh, uh, he tried to compose his uh, uh, mystic verses. He was speaking like Kabir. Uh, he lived in early 19th century. He used that uh, disguise, the strategy kind of disguise that was used by Sufis like Kabir. Uh, but uh, he, he perished. And he is actually the forerunner of social reform in South Kerala. And after that, we have Taikada Yav, another social reformer, uh, and a, also a, a, a yoga guru of Narana Guru and Chattambi Swamigal himself. And uh, um, this uh, Aya uh, of Taikad was also a, 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 a British resident. He was the manager of the British uh, residency in Travan. He was not the resident, the European was the resident, but he was the manager of that residency because he was also a Siddha kind of medical practitioner and he was influential with the Britishers. So he actually passed on that uh, liberative wisdom and that uh, social uh, practices to Narana Guru and Chattambi Swamigal, and they have unleashed uh, the kind of social reform uh, in uh, the uh, in the Shudras, especially Chattambi Swami, who came from the uh, the Savarna, the Shudra section, uh, the Nair uh, community background. So he uh, was for a lot of social reform uh, among the Shudras of Kerala, the Malayali Shudra. And as a result, you have the struggles for representation, which is called the Malayali Memorial that happened towards the end of the uh, 19th century. And Narayana Guru was actually from the Avarna section, the untouchable section called the Iravas and Thiyas of Kerala, uh, which is a, a, in mu numerical strength, which is a much more larger kind of a community. The communitization itself, the idea of community, communitization, and also a kind of uh, uh, going beyond the Brahmanical value sphere and the meta-referential structure of the Vedic and Vedantic metaphysics, the kind of uh, rational kind of outlook, everything was uh, a secular uh, and modern uh, kind of human subjectivity was in the making through the work of the Guru uh, in polyphonic ways, not just the Guru, the Guru, Narana Guru and his followers. Uh, some of the revolutionary leaders of Renaissance in Kerala, they came from the uh, the uh, uh, from the uh, school of Narayana Guru. Sahodar Nayapan, for example. Sahodar Nayapan has uh, been the most prominent rationalist and uh, atheist and uh, also a neo-Buddhist at the same time. So he uh, and Mithavadi advocate, Mithavadi Christian modern education, legal studies. Uh, many of them have become jurists by studying English language and uh, law that was created by the colonial modern kind of paradigm. So they have embraced the guru himself has made this statement in 1914. Uh, he never learned English language. He was a scholar in Sanskrit, Malayalam and Tamil, but he never got an opportunity to learn English language. But he has acknowledged the guru Narana Guru of Kerala has acknowledged modernity as his greatest teacher. He, in 1914, when the First World War was in the making, he made this public statement with his disciples that it is the, uh, the, the British who are our gurus. The guru has never accepted a guru from India or Asia, but he, he claimed that in 1914, he claimed that it is the British who gave us sannyasam or the right to education and knowledge because if it was in the time of Ram, I would have been beheaded by the Lord himself like uh, what happened to Shambhuga. Because Shambhuga was just a Shudra and he, uh, he did try to learn the, 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 the art of writing and reading and he taught other Shudra kids and he tried to become a sage and scholar and a sannyasi. That's why he was beheaded by Ram. Uh, because it was a violation of the, the caste and Varna, Chaturvarnya system, a Shudra trying to be a scholar and a sage. So that, uh, that's why the Guru said, if it was in the time of uh, Ram, if it was in Ramraj, 
uh, we know about the fate of Shambugas, what happened to Shambugas and Ekelevias and others. Uh, it's uh, part of the cultural uh, traditional history of uh, India. Uh, so the Guru has acknowledged the contribution of this modern paradigm, modernity at last. So he was embracing the advantages and the good uh, effects uh, and fruits of modernity at last when he made this statement in 1940. Uh, so uh, it is actually the, uh, the the churning that was created, the intellectual kind of uh, uh, turmoil, the kind of uh, ruptures that were created by the colonial intervention that created the organic intellectuals like uh, Yavai Kunta or Naranaguru and his uh, radical disciples like Saudar Nayapen and so on. And that has revolutionized Kerala. That has created a kind of modern. It's it's having many pre-modern tendencies. Now it's back into regression, especially after the Shudra rights of Shabarimala that actually uh, sabotaged the Indian constitution itself because it was a, an anti-legal and anti-constitutional struggle against the, the verdict of the Supreme Court for gender justice. So that kind of backlashes has happened in times of... Uh, religious revivalism and fanaticism in the country. But uh, the, the model of Kerala Renaissance is so unique that it was actually uh, a secular and a polyphonic and a democratic kind of struggle against the caste system and the rooted hegemony of, uh, uh, of Kerala. And also it, uh, it is applicable to the whole nation as a model. That's how Kerala has become a uh, model state in many respects, in education, in public health, in uh, other uh, forms of human development indicators. Kerala has equaled uh, uh, the, uh, it has come on par with the uh, many developed kind of nations in the world because of this uh, struggle, the educational struggles of Ayankali, the Dalit leader must also be remembered when the Guru has given his great messages of education and organizations and communitarian kind of formations. It was Ayankali who struggled hard for the human rights and educational rights of the Dalits and also the articulations of Poyi Lapachan and other Dalit leaders uh, which are now being recovered and uh, uh, rehabilitated into the formation of Kerala modernity uh, that is happening now. But unfortunately, uh, things have uh, receded back into uh, the reactionary kind of pre-modern uh, uh, kind of barbarism. So that's the, uh, the context where we need to defend modernity. We need to re-strengthen uh, the, the foundations of our modernity so that uh, democracy may, uh, may regenerate from the grassroots in, uh, in Kerala and also in the country. Very interesting observation. Uh, Professor Shekhar, uh, I have a question in mind. Uh, do you then think like say Kancha, Ilaya, Ailaya, Shepard uh, or some other scholars that colonial modernity played a uh, played a remarkable role, an emancipatory role for the Dalits in India? Don't you think that yes. on the one hand it on the one hand it colonized the whole Indian nation, but if we specifically look at the condition of the Dalits, then we will find that Dalits felt much more emancipated, much more liberated when they came in touch with Western education and Western modernity. So is it not a paradoxical situation? How do you explain it? Yeah, it's uh, as I told you, this is actually the dialectics of modernity in India. On one hand, it is colonial modernity. We are having the colonial baggage. But we need to be critical about the colonial kind of uh, uh, dimensions. And we need to embrace the liberative aspects of that modernity. That's what the Guru did. That's what Mahatma Phule did. That's what uh, um, um, uh, what uh, Savitri Bhai Phule did. So um, uh, everywhere, that's what the Pediyor in Tamilagam 
he was also that's what uh, ayodhi thas pandidar of Tam of, of tamilagam did even before pedio uh, who is actually the pioneer of the dravidian movement in uh, in the whole of india and who is also the first uh, neo buddhist uh, uh, kind of missionary and activist in the whole of india even before ambedkar before sadarna ayyappan and mithavadi in kerala uh, it was uh, ayodhi thas pandidar who embraced it because uh, he came from a dalit family who were exposed to english and modernity for at least uh, two three generations that's the same with uh, uh, maloji sakpal and ramji sakpal and b r ambedkar himself that's why we have a constitution so the modern india the democratic india is a product of phule ambedkarite uh, kind of revolution which is uh, uh, the, the, those who have directly acknowledged the contributions of uh, colonial modernity that's why mahatma phule he had his kusturaj baliraj and kusturaj because he received primary education basically from uh, scottish missionaries and the european kind of uh, education system he was denied that by saying that Uh, despite being such a wealthy and influential and prosperous kind of a uh, person uh, they abused him as a shudra and he was denied the kind of sanskritic kind of elite education ambedkar also wanted to uh, learn the sanskrit and prakrit and all but he was denied by saying that he was an untouchable but ambedkar he after getting all those research degrees from europe and america from colombia he came back and created this modern democratic constitution for india that's why we have a modern india so it's a direct outcome of english education and modernity at large which that's why i uh, invoked narayana guru saying that it is the british who are our masters or gurus it is western enlightenment modernity that uh, we need to acknowledge as one of the greatest teachers of uh, the world uh, so this has been acknowledged not just by the guru in kerala but by mahatma phule through his life and efforts in in in, in western india and also by pandit ayodhi thasa uh, who actually who uh, who worked with the canal uh, all court and uh, reverend john ratnam and other britishers and uh, british even christian missionaries uh, he was in a uh, tandem with and the theosophical society and he went to sri lanka and he took diksha from there and uh, he came back and created a shakya buddhist society in the nilgiris of tamil nadu that's why the first uh, uh, dalit movement which is a uh, a neo buddhist movement that was formed even before ambedkar and before uh, uh, narayana guru's uh, disciples other and, and midavadi in kerala so uh, definitely uh, the people the dalit bahujans of this country and women and minorities in particular they have been or the majority of people in india that means only 90 uh, almost 90 to 95% of india uh we have benefited from the intervention of modernity mm -hmm. and also english education and modernity uh, uh at large so that's why we need to acknowledge it and uh, uh, the modern india is a creation of the uh, the phule ambedkarite kind of uh, evolution where we also have to include people like uh, ayodhi thasar and narayana guru and perior and others from south india also then it becomes a broader kind of modern paradigm uh, throughout india that began from 19th century onwards uh, after the intervention of the uh, the english uh, and uh, 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 british uh, kind of missionaries in particular throughout india as uh, just one thing uh, i agree with you just one argument i must draw your attention to this because several people are talking about it suppose the indian caste system it is a horrible kind of cruel inhuman system and its equivalent is perhaps only the apartheid or racism uh but brahminical caste system is found in india it is a unique feature of indian hindu society whereas colonialism 
is all pervading throughout the world. So if you are to evaluate the relative gravity of both the enemies of the people, which one are you going to identify as the greater enemy? Indian caste system is confined to Indian Hindu society only, whereas global capitalism, imperialism or colonialism that pervades all over the world. So one Marxist argument comes in along this line that colonialism was a much greater, a far stronger enemy pervading the whole world whereas Indian caste system was confined to Indian Hindu society alone. So it is a much weaker enemy as compared to colonialism. What will be your stand about this if you were to judge the relative gravity, the relative importance, or if you were to judge which one is the greater enemy? If I take up the example of Bhima Koregao, the, uh, this... Uh, famous uh, uprising of the Mahar people uh, and the position of Ambedkar. What will be your position about that? Okay, uh, right. Uh, it's actually a complex issue and uh, we need to be uh, 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 very, what you call, uh, there should be a kind of uh, strategic essentialism. Uh, in addressing this issue. So while on a global footing, you need to fight uh, capitalism and its imperial kind of underpinnings, that's uh, certain. But at the same time, in South Asia, in India, uh, not just the Hindu society, but even the minority religions, even the latest religion that is Sikhism in India, and therefore it's having diasporic communities all, all over the world, the Sikh diaspora, it is there in the US and uh, Europe and everywhere, even in Australia, you have it. So even the minority religions in India are being uh, infiltrated and uh, polluted by the purity, pollution, riddles of Brahmanism. That's why we have the Dalit Christians in Kerala, Pahil Apachan, whom I translated into English, I mentioned Pahil Apachan was actually uh, raising that injustice that has crept into the churches also. Uh, and uh, we have the Dalit Bahujan Muslim issue, the elitism, Asghar, the late uh, Asghar Ali engineer, he has enlightened us about the kind of social stratifications and the caste system, uh, the Varma kind of cleavages existing within the Muslims of India. Um, and uh, the Dalit Sikh and the uh, Jap Sikh, the Savarna Sikh, the caste Hindu kind of aspirations within the, the youngest religion of India that was born only in the 15th century. Uh, so uh, it is not just an issue of the so-called Hindu society. Hindu society is actually a myth. Actually, there are castes and conflicting castes uh, in the graded hierarchical inequality structure of uh, India, as Ambedkar has uh, uh, pointed out, and Louis Dumont and uh, French and European scholars have done about it. So uh, it is a much more complex issue than we think. It's there throughout uh, South Asia. It's not just in India. Wherever Indians have gone, they have carried this caste consciousness and the caste kind of purity and untouchability along with them. That's why we have the caste in the American diaspora uh, uh, and also the European diaspora in the Australian situation. And even in New Zealand, these are new settlements. We have it there. So uh, it is to be addressed in South Asia. It is, to, is the lasting imperialism because uh, uh, as many scholars have pointed out, British imperialism was only for less than 200 years in India. After the Bengal and Baksar war, they got absolute power in North India. And only after the defeat of Tipu Sultan, after the Carnatic Wars with Hyder Ali and Tipu, they got an absolute monopoly of South India. So only from the, eight, uh, the beginning of the 1800s, they got a, a kind of uh, uh, totalitarian control of, uh, of India as such as the subcontinent. Uh, so it was, and they left. Uh, the decolonization happened at the middle part of the 20th century. So they left here in 1947. That means only 150 years or maximum you take 
or less than 200 years of petition period. Some of uh, how can we write this much about the 200 year old British imperialism and uh, the more than 2000 year old from the codification of the Manuswadi, people were suffering. Shudras were dehumanized. Women of all castes and varnas were seen as uh, uh, as Shudra, as equal to Shidra, like uh, women are equal to the nigger in the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy of the West, as Bell Hooks, who passed away recently, argued here, women of all Varnas and castes, even Brahman women and Kshatriya women, they were considered as equal to Shudra and menial slaves. So it dehumanized the Shudras and the Avarnas in particular, and the Dalits and Adivasis also, they suffered mostly at the bottom and the periphery of things. So this was for, at least from the time of the Buddha, uh, it was happening. So at least 2,500 years of suffering and humiliations, dehumanizations have gone into it. So this is the most rooted and entrenched uh, form of casteist, racist, sexist patriarchy in the world. And it is to be fought, at least in India, at least in South Asia. We need to uh, give priority to this. So uh, the class politics or uh, the broader macro politics, it is there. The fight against imperialism, European empire and colonialism, capitalism, it is to be there. And it must be uh, continued on a global footage, uh, along with the struggles of the black and people of color. So racism and sexism and issues of sexuality, LGBTQI people, uh, the sexual minorities, all these things have to be incorporated into the uh, struggle against patriarchy, because uh, patriarchy and capitalism, because it is not a pure capitalism that is existing out there. In India, it is a Brahmanical corporate capitalism. In the West, it is a white supremacist heteropatriarchal capitalism. That is the so we have to include and broader our framework of intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw and Bell Hooks and Alice Walker and Tony Morrison and Cornel West and all these people of color uh, 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 and also uh, people like uh, Stuart Hall and Paul Gilroy have elaborated. We need to address these problems of modernity at large. Also, so we need to be critical modernists, not postmodernists in the fashionable way, but very critical of uh, the problems of modernity. And we need to address the diversity and intersectionality of uh, uh, various inequalities. So not just class, class struggle uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the struggle against racism and sexism and other forms of oppression, intersectionality issues should also be brought into the uh, uh, into the agenda of uh, struggle, a whole way of struggle, a whole way of culture. Uh, th therefore, it, 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 it becomes a part of uh, an inevitable uh, cultural studies and cultural politics project. So that's uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the way forward, taking culture as a whole way of life and a whole way of struggle and addressing the diversity and intersectionality and inequalities at various levels must be addressed simultaneously. So you cannot separate uh, the critique of caste uh, and the critique of gender here in India because Brahmanic patriarchy is so wedded. It's a double-edged kind of sword as elaborated by mainstream feminists like Umar Chakravarti or uh, further explored by Dalit Bahujan feminists like uh, Sharmila Rage or um, Anupama Rao, for example. So we need to address the issues of uh, uh, multiple inequalities. And uh, at least in India, we need to give uh, priority to uh, the struggle against the caste uh, system and Brahmanical patriarchy at large. At the same time, the struggle, the broader global struggle against capitalism and imperialism must continue as well. That's my multi-pronged kind of uh, polyphonic strategy and uh, a perspective on that issue. Thank you very much for giving a clear position on the issue. Now let us look at uh, uh, something different. Can you please tell us a little more elaborately about the Dalit poetry of Poikail Apachan? I don't know whether my pronunciation is correct or not. Uh, exactly. Sir. If I am wrong, please actually, correct it. Let us. Poikail Apachan. Yeah. Poigail is his family name. His uh, his family's uh, 
name. Poigil means at the pond, uh, uh, by the pond. Poiga is a pond. Uh, and Apachan means uh, the father, uh, the, uh, the leader and the father. Uh, or even the grandfathers are called Apachan in a very respectful fashion in Kerala by the people. So he actually acted as a father and mother to the people. That's why he was uh, fondly, affectionately called, addressed as Apachan by the people. Actually, he was in a late 19th and early 20th century Dalit reformer who came from the Sambhava or Paraya section of the community, the most downtrodden among uh, the Dalits and Bahujans in Kerala. And uh, he was uh, actually reviving the memory of struggle, memory of slavery, the caste slavery that was there in Kerala. And he threw his songs and spirituals, like the Negro spirituals, we talk about the African-American uh, slave narratives and the Negro spirituals and the emergence of the African-American uh, community spirit. So likewise, he created a community, a feeling of community and uh, a camaraderie and a cultural kind of resistance against this caste slavery of Kerala through his songs and spirituals. And he also organized the people into something, a different sect outside Hinduism outside Christianity. He was, uh, uh, at the beginning, he was uh, with the churches. He was a, uh, a scholar of the Bible. He was a preacher. He was called uh, Yohanan the preacher. Uh, he also had the baptized Christian name Yohanan. Uh, so that's why he's also called Poigail Yohanan. But he came out of all those churches and congregations and he created his own organization for the untouchables. That's called the Pratyaksha Reksha Daiva Sabha or uh, the Society for the Sudden Salvation of the People. And that is uh, go, uh, otherwise called, shortly called PRDS, which was founded by Pegela Pachan in a colonial, again in a colonial British court in uh, Changanashiri in Travancore in 1910. He declared it when he was arrested. He was doing some peace rallies. He was uh, doing some kind of evangelical conventions that actually uh, moved the people. So the Britishers uh, and the, even the missionaries, British missionaries, they uh, became suspicious about him. And they felt some kind of sabotage of the Christian evangelical uh, preaching and missions in uh, in Kerala. So uh, he was arrested by the British police and he came to that British court and he declared that I am the leader of this untouchable people, uh, the Dalits here, and my organization is Pratyaksha Raksha Daiva Sabha. So he has revolutionized the Dalit kind of uh, rebellion in Kerala in early 20th century. That's why he is to be held as uh, Ayankali and Naranaguru and uh, Vaikadaya and Ayavaigunta and all those makers of modernity in Kerala. So Apachan uh, represents that vibrant spirit of modernity, the vibrant spirit of Dalit rebellion and Dalit revolt against the caste inequality. And he revived the memory of slavery through his songs and narratives. And fortunately, the songs are still surviving. And uh, I got an, a, an opportunity to translate it into English language. Uh, so Apachan represents that most dynamic, energetic face of uh, Dalit rebellion in Kerala modernity during the Renaissance in early 20th century. Many such voices, at least uh, uh, from the Middle Ages, we have such voices like Pakanar, the legendary, another legendary Paraya poet who was actually uh, a contemporary of Hiruthachan himself, who is uh, hailed as the father of Malayalam poetry. So from those verses of Pakanar, the 900 verses of Pakanar that was uh, lost and erased perhaps in the conquest, cultural kind of invasions uh, from Pakanar of uh, the Middle Ages uh, to the Chodi Chatan, the Adi Pulaya Kavi, the first uh, Dalit poet in early 20th century, uh, Chodi Chatan of Cochin. Uh, to Poigai Lapachan and beyond. Now, actually, Dalit poetry and Dalit literature uh, are flourishing in, in Kerala. Plenty of uh, books are being published here. The Oxford University Press, they have uh, published an English anthology edited by Professor M. Darshan and uh, Padib and Pambedi Kunu and others. Uh, and uh, Susi Thayru and uh, 
Kesatinarayan. They have published uh, another volume by Penguin on Dalit fighting of South India, in which one volume is on Tamil and Malayalam. So now it has become the most dynamic and democratic and diverse uh, kind of uh, poetry and writing from South India. And uh, Dalit literature has come of age in Kerala, and Poike Lapachan is the most uh, illuminating example of that uh, cultural struggle and resistance uh, against uh, uh, the project of uh, uh, divide and rule in India, the lasting empire in India, uh, the Chaturvarnia regime of India. And uh, what do you think about the Avarna poets, especially Mulur? Kadupan and Sahodaran, what about their role in the democratic resistance to cultural nationalism? Yeah, that is the very important uh, people's tradition that is dormant, that is actually uh, silenced uh, at the foundation of Kerala culture, contemporary culture today. The struggles of the Avarna people, especially after the interventions of Narana Guru, his disciples like Mulur, uh, Papana Papanika, Mulur and uh, Pandit Karupan, who are actually the first uh, Avarna poets or Bahujan poets to come from the bottom of the society, they have revolutionized uh, a literary canon in, in Kerala. They have uh, came into uh, the public institution of literature because the Avarnas were never allowed to come anywhere near the institution of literature and the canonical kind of literature because it was considered as a caste Hindu privilege and uh, uh, pure space. Because of the Buddhist kind of uh, legacy, they were uh, treated as uh, untouchables. So it is actually Mulur who has revolutionized the public sphere and the literary sphere and uh, created and carved his uh, niche in the institution of uh, Malayalam literature as an Avarna poet. So uh, he has uh, uh, done a lot of literary battles with the dominant caste Hindu figures who were the lords and masters of uh, uh, that time, especially towards the end of the 19th and early 20th century. This was possible because of the kind of epistemological and uh, social uh, and political cultural interventions made possible by Narana Guru himself. Then actually it is uh, uh, Pandit Karupan who has expanded and uh, propagated this idea of liberation, this casteless kind of uh, uh, solidarity and camaraderie among the people of Cochin in northern part of Kerala. Uh, he actually founded many societies and organizations for the Dalits and untouchables. Uh, and also he revolutionized uh, literary sphere by writing about caste in a critical way in Jadikumi and uh, in many other uh, uh, literary works and even in drama, uh, in theater, he has revolutionized theater, Malayalam theater by introducing a Dalit or untouchable as the hero of his play. Uh, so uh, uh, Pandit Karupan and then Sahodaran, actually he radicalized and revolutionized the uh, literary public sphere and also uh, the uh, media sphere, the print media, journalism was revolutionized and also poetry was uh, uh, made into a rational praxis by Sahodaran. And he also began the intercaste and interdining programs and the uh, Mishra Vivaha and Mishra Bhojana, interdining and intermarriage kind of uh, things that actually elaborated the philosophy of the Guru, uh, becoming human, by breaking caste, the caste of humanity is humanness itself, manushyanam, manushyatum, jadi. Like uh, the caste of the cow is the bovin or the 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 uh, the animalness. The caste of the human is humanity itself. That was actually the key philosophy of the guru in jadi lakshanam and jadi nirnaya. Uh, so uh, Sahar actually practiced that, and he created a kind of public sphere where all castes can come together and he actually uh, publicized and organized that 1917 historic interdining at Cherai. And uh, he uh, was actually the founder editor of uh, that uh, Southern journal and also the Yuktivadi journal. And uh, he unleashed the rationalist and atheist movement. And also he pioneered the neo-Buddhist movement 
uh, along with uh, Advocate uh, Sri Krishna. So these revolutionaries have actually uh, created the modern public sphere and democratic uh, modernity of Kerala. And their contributions are to be recovered and revitalized and uh, uh, deployed among the public and also the new generation, the coming generation through the textbooks, through the pedagogy, especially at uh, the higher education level, new studies and projects and uh, uh, textual kind of uh, explorations and interventions are to be done based on Mulur, uh, Karupan and Sahodaran at large. Thank you very much, Professor Shekhar. Our time is over. Uh, but uh, one last question I cannot resist asking you that in West Bengal, we had a left government uh, for 34 years, more than that. And in Kerala, you have a left government a party is in power which calls itself a communist party marxist so do you think that this leftist party leftist government in power has made it more comfortable for the dalit avarna Bahujana, has it weakened the inhuman caste system? Has it been able to secularize the cultural politics towards a casteless society, not only a classless society, but also a casteless society? What do you think about this? It is directly a question on politics, and if you want, you can answer it. Yeah, definitely, it's a, a very important and uh, uh, critical question of the present. How far? Of course, many things have happened and many things have changed for the better. At the same time, as I mentioned earlier, many reactionary, regressive uh, things have also happened. Uh, uh, in recent times in Kerala, especially many constitutional kind of deadlocks were created. And uh, this is not just a problem with the ruling kind of government or the ruling coalition, but actually the problem that is deeply rooted in our society. Because our society is being uh, communalized and polarized and uh, the forces of casteism and communalism are operating in a deeply uh, kind of uh, reactionary way. That's why society as such is being uh, 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 primitivized and many reactionary regressions are, are taking place. So it's not just a problem of the government. Uh, it is to be addressed, of course, by the government. And uh, many policy shifts have been there, but more uh, required, especially in education especially from the early stage to the higher stages of education, uh, the kind of uh, egalitarian kind of uh, uh, spirit, egalitarian kind of traditions, egalitarian and democratic struggles of renaissance and modernity are to be highlighted and brought in. So that's the space of the rational debates between the guru and his disciples, the guru and sahodaran, guru and sivi kunyaraman, Guru and Mitavadi, and uh, many uh, kind of uh, verses, the anti-caste verses uh, like Pandit Karupan's Jadi Kumi, Sahodaran's poetry. Hoigil uh, Apachan is already in the syllabus now, but we need to now showcase uh, Sahodaran Mulu, who actually who was uh, the first uh, our poet in Kerala. So these kind of uh, uh, anti-caste legacies and traditions and literary kind of inputs are to be brought into pedagogy, uh, especially at uh, higher education, starting from the lower levels. So only that kind of uh, uh, policy changes and shifts can ensure uh, the, the way ahead, the progress ahead. Many things have changed for the better, but still a lot required, according to me. 
थैंक यू वेरी मच डॉक्टर अजय शेखर फॉर दिस एनलाइटेनिंग डिस्कशन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर बीइंग हियर दिस इंटरव्यू कम्स टू ए स्टॉप नाउ एंड दिस इंटरव्यू विल बी अपलोडेड ऑन यूट्यूब फॉर ए लार्जर सेक्शन ऑफ ऑडियंस within 2 3 days and i will send the links again thank you very much the audience is part of us and especially dr rajesh shikhar thank you very much thank you so much no, sir sir we bless you for this opportunity i thank all the audience and the well wishes thank you now sir so we live okay right